Hello, brothers and sisters. Pastor Danny here from the Oceanside United Reformed Church, and I want to welcome you to the Pastor's Bible Study. Uh, this is our bi-monthly, twice a month Bible study uh, that we meet uh, We meet here on Tuesdays. And uh, we're currently studying together the book of Revelation, so the last book of the Bible, the last book of the New Testament. And we want to uh, jump in this day, uh, continuing through where we left off, chapter 21, verses 1 through 8. And what we're going to be thinking uh, today about the new heavens and earth, the new heavens and earth. Uh, first of all, you want to grab a Bible. And then secondly, you, you want to go onto our website, OceansideURC, OceansideURC.org. And you'll see there on the navigation bar, a little drop-down menu that goes to uh, the midweek Bible study, the pastor's Bible study, and you'll find this document uh, for Revelation. So here we go. Today it's uh, Revelation 21, 1 through 8. You'll see that at the bottom of that page. Uh, you want to download that. You can print it um, onto your. You can download it to your device, print it off, take, use notes, and so forth. So that's our. Those will be our study notes for our study today. So I encourage you to uh, to grab a hold of one of those, and also, like I said, have a Bible. So. Let's uh, begin together with prayer, um, asking the Lord to give to our hearts and our minds uh, knowledge and insight into the Word so that we would know the depth and the breadth, the height, the length of God's love for us in Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord. We bless you for your amazing love and your grace to us in Jesus Christ. We pray uh, today as we take up this uh, beautiful image, this beautiful revelation, this beautiful vision that we would know your amazing love in Jesus Christ that is in store for us in the future that we experience now, Lord, by faith and one day will be by sight. We long for that day to come. Help us, Lord, to uh, to know this part of your word so that we might be confident and joyful, so that we might be empowered uh, and enlivened to serve you and to be witnesses of your amazing grace in a dark and dying generation. Father, we pray for our various needs, our various concerns, our burdens, and our worries. We cast them all upon you because you care for us. Make our concerns your own and grant to us, Lord, answers and help and healing uh, according to your perfect and good will. We ask it all in Jesus' name and all of God's people say, amen. Okay, so Revelation 21 today. Uh, it's the 11th of May, 2021, and we're going to be here in uh, Revelation 21, 1 through 8. And let me read those verses uh, for us. If you have a Bible, you can follow along as well. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne, saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them. And they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. So far, God's word, and may he write it upon our hearts. So Revelation 21 one through eight, the new heavens and earth. Uh, here we go. Here we go. Uh, we have reached the end of Revelation. And uh, in these next few studies, we will be meditating upon these final two chapters, which present for us and to us visions of a new heavens and new earth. Uh, we'll see that here in this study. Uh, next, we'll look at a new Jerusalem. That's the rest part, the rest of uh, chapter 21. And then the vision ends up with a new garden. That's in chapter number 22, before there's some uh, final, uh, final matters uh, in, this, in this letter from Jesus to the churches of the Revelation. 
After God has given to Jesus, uh, to give to an angel, to give to John, to give to us, we come to this glorious climax here in Revelation 21. Uh, what have we seen so far? Uh, to put it in personal terms, we've seen how weak and sinful we truly are. Uh, as a pastor and along with uh, elders that we, uh, whom, whom I serve alongside with together, uh, we've been warned uh, as a congregation and uh, we, where, whoever you are, wherever you find yourself uh, attached to, to, a, to a local church, uh, we are warned here that if we don't step up and protect you uh, as pastors and elders from false doctrines and sinful living, Jesus says he will remove the light of his spirit from us. We saw that way back in chapters 2 and 3. As Christians, we've been warned not to give up our confession of Jesus, regardless of the threats of the devil, who uses the power of persecuting government uh, and uh, as his spokesman and henchman. As Christians, we've been warned not to be of the world called Babylon, even though we live in it. Whether you realize it or not, there is a real spiritual struggle for your soul, and Revelation has been all about that uh, for 20 chapters. Our theme here in chapter 21 is a vision of what awaits us who persevere in faith against all the assaults of the dragon, all the assaults of his beasts, all the assaults of Babylon. Philosophers describe uh, what we're going to see here in terms of three great questions. Who am I? Where did I come from? Where am I going? Who am I? Where did I come from? Where am I going? Our lives were made to go somewhere, to move towards a purpose. Amen? And we see that purpose here in Revelation 21, a new heavens and a new earth. So if you have the study notes uh, with you, again, you want to go on to our church's website, OceansideURC.org, and uh, find the drop-down menu there for the weekly Bible study, and you'll see some notes. You can download or print those off. First of all, I want you to see here in Revelation 21, 1 to 8, it's newness imagined. The new heavens, new earth, it's newness imagined. The Bible, the Bible opens up with that great and grand opening statement, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. It closes with this final scene. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. So to put those two uh, heavens and earths uh, in contrast, all things were made upright in the beginning, then all things fell because of Adam's sin. And so we're looking forward to a new one. Uh, in the end, all things will be repaired then. Creation was once marred by rebellion, uh, but, uh, but, but uh, uh, we shall be what God intended. Uh, the creation shall be what God intended it to be through restoration. So there was once rebellion, and now there's restoration. The big question in, the, in this verse, verse number one, is whether all things being made new in recreation means a renovation or an annihilation. A renovation, that is to take what is old and to remake it, uh, to renew it, refresh it, or to take what is old and to get rid of it and start over. Uh, I believe God's word teaches that the God who created all things with the goal of enjoying fellowship with him means that despite sin's temporary frustration of this goal, God will reverse the curse. Paradise lost will become paradise regained. Uh, and the word John uses here for new, a new heaven and a new earth. Uh, kainon uh, means new in comparison to what is old, new in comparison to what is obsolete. The new heaven and new earth are new in quality, not in kind. They are of the same uh, genus of earth, but of a new species, new heaven, new earth. Uh, let me give you two biblical analogies to the new heaven and the new earth. Uh, first of all, the heavens and earth are made new like we are made new when we are born again. So that's one analogy of what this new heavens, new earth means. The analogy with what we once were and what we become, and then what the creation is and what it becomes. So just like we are made new and we are born again, so to the heavens and the earth will be made new. Jesus made us a new creation, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17. His recreating us is mirrored in the new creation. Just as we are renewed from the old nature and not created ex nihilo, so too this creation will be renewed. The new from the old, the old into the new. Jesus himself, in fact, calls the period of time in which he returns the regeneration, Matthew 19, verse 28. Secondly, a uh, second biblical analogy of the new heavens and new earth, and what it means that, that uh, they will be new. 
uh, is this. The heavens and earth are made new like Jesus was made new when he rose again. Jesus' death and resurrection are like an old creation and new creation. We see that in Colossians 1, for example. Uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul says that Jesus is last Adam in contrast to the first Adam. He's the man from heaven in contrast to the man who is from the dust. Just as his earthly body was transformed into a spiritual body, capital S, Holy Spirit body, uh, raised by the Spirit, endowed with the Holy Spirit, so too it will be with the new creation. Uh, think about you know illustrations, things like caterpillars uh, that become butterflies. Uh, but a butterfly doesn't look like a caterpillar. It looks like a completely new creature. Uh, they're the same, but they're different. Or think about a diamond ring that uh, most married women wear in our culture. Uh, where does the diamond come from? It comes from black coal, something like black coal, carbon. Uh, think of a lemon seed. If you plant it, what does it become? And it becomes an entire lemon tree, and then you can make lemonade. Uh, let me illustrate this with one last Bible passage, Romans chapter 8. So if you have a Bible, you can turn there with me. Romans 8, verses 18 through uh, 25. Romans 8, verses 18 through 25. Uh, the parallel here in, Re in Romans 8 is the liberty of both the sons of God and the physical creation. Thus, as it will be with one, the sons of God, so it will be with the other, the whole creation. As we groan under the sufferings of this present time, verse 18, so too the creation was subjected to futility, so that it too groans and labors with birth pangs. But the created realm was subjected in hope, and that hope is to be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the sons of God. Uh, it's this creation that was subjected to futility and hope, and it will be this very same creation that is given liberty along with the sons of God. So just like we have been given liberty from our sins in the same way the creation will be given liberty from its bondage uh, into sin. So there will be a new heavens and a new earth uh, in the sense that we are new creations, in the sense that Jesus was raised again, in the sense that uh, the creation is going to have the same kind of liberty that we also have uh, as believers. John also imagines here, secondly, uh, in this uh, in this, uh, on, on our first point, it's newness imagined. Uh, he imagines this newness in that little phrase at the end of verse number one, where he says, let's turn back there to Revelation chapter one, uh, where he says, and the sea was no more, and the sea was no more. Now, we've already seen many, many times before this uh, how, old, how, how, how Revelation draws upon the Old Testament, and this is uh, no different. And we've also seen in Revelation how the imagery of a sea uh, is an Old Testament image of the powers that come against the Lord and against his people. We saw that in chapter 13. Uh, the sea is the place from which the dragon's beasts come. And so the sea is emblematic. It's symbolic of all the nations, all the raging, all the tumult, as Psalm 1 says, uh, that rises up against, against the Lord. And so in that time of new heavens and new earth, there will be no more sea. There will be no more uh, ungodly nations, no more tyrants, no more persecution, no more oppression, no more injustice. All things are going to be made new. And the sea was no more. So its newness is uh, imagined here. But notice, secondly, it's also inhabited. Its newness is inhabited. Uh, if it was, this was just merely an image of a new heavens, new earth, but yet we were to have no place in it, it would, it would be literally pie in the sky, wouldn't it? Uh, but it has to be inhabited for us to have some benefit with it uh, and from it. So I want you to think, as we think about, uh, again, this newness and its inhabitation, uh, in Revelation, think way back to the seven letters in chapters two and three. Think about all the imperfections that Jesus described in those ancient churches. Uh, and we looked at many in many ways how those how those uh, uh, condemnations and descriptions apply to us. Uh, are you tired of your sin nature that causes you to actually sin? Are you tired of felling with your uh, fighting with your fellow Christians? Are you tired of that feeling that you get serving Jesus Church only to step back and see how much more there is to do and and you end up feeling hopeless? Are you tired of living in societies uh, that never seem uh, to exhibit uh, in a consistent way love and justice. Are you tired of these things? 
well, this new heavens, new earth uh, encourages us as it has inhabitants. John says, the inhabitants are you, you and me as believers. And I saw the, the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Uh, literally notice the New Jerusalem is from heaven, from God. Uh, well, what is it? Or better, who is it? Way back when in chapter 3, at verse number 12, we read about the overcomers themselves uh, being the pillars in the temple of God. We saw in chapter number 19, verses 7 and 8, the marriage supper of the Lamb uh, being described. The bride has prepared herself, being adorned in fine linen. Uh, fine linen, And that image of fine linen was explained for us with the phrase, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Uh, and that kind of language is reflected here in verse 2 of Revelation 21. The holy city, New Jerusalem, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Uh, note that the city is described with the simile as, uh, and described in feminine terms, a bride, as a bride adorned for her husband. Uh, so what will inhabit the new heavens and new earth? More accurately, who will inhabit it? A bride adorned for her husband, the church, the bride of Jesus Christ, as Paul tells us in Ephesians 5. Jesus assures you uh, as a believer here, as we just pause for a moment of application, uh, when we read this beautiful image and we see the newness of the new heavens and new earth inhabited by this bride, uh, the church, you know, if you are a believer, uh, know that the Lord has left this earth. He's gone to prepare a place for you in that very new heavens, in this very new heavens and new earth. Be assured, be comfort, uh, comforted, be confident. Uh, and Jesus also offers you a place if you don't yet believe in Jesus. He offers you a place in this new heavens and new earth. He offers that you will be a part of this bride uh, who the Lord makes new and uh, gives love and fullness of love to uh, in this beautiful ultimate sense. So we see here the newness of the new heavens and new earth uh, imagined in terms of new heavens and new earth coming down out of God. It's a new Jerusalem. We see it inhabited by the bride, uh, adorned for her husband, uh, like a holy city, like the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. And then notice thirdly, it's newness inherited. It's newness inherited. So think about an inheritance. Well, what is an inheritance? Um, you know, it's something like, you know, when your grandma or your grandpa or your, your mother or your father uh, or a loved one that's close to you, uh, when, when they die, uh, one of the ways that they can show how much they cared about you uh, is to leave something for you. Sometimes it might be, you know, a special picture. Sometimes it might be a ring. Sometimes it could be some money. It could be a, a house even. Um, or it can be other kinds of possessions, things that were special, things that were important, things that were precious to you, uh, or even enough you know, to, to care for you uh, as your life goes on. Jesus says the inheritance that he's given to us is something that it's beyond our wildest imaginations. It's something that's uh, uh, imperishable, undefiled, unstained, reserved in heaven for us. It's something that we can't quantify completely uh, and totally. Well, what's the inheritance of the inhabitants of this new creation? I want you to see here a few things uh, about this inheritance. Uh, first of all, it's the presence of God himself. The inheritance is the presence of God himself. Chapter 21 of Revelation, verse number 3. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them. They will be his people. God himself will be with them as their God. So ultimately, the inheritance of the newness of the new heavens and new earth is God himself, the Lord himself. And that was the goal of all of God's physical, tangible, earthly dwelling places throughout ancient history with his people. Whether it was uh, the place where Jacob laid his head, Bethel, the house of God, whether it was the tabernacle of Moses in the wilderness, whether it was the temple of Solomon, uh, in all of its glory, uh, God's dwelling places in the Old Testament were all meant to point to this great goal that God dwells with his people. God is present. The Lord is in our midst. Uh, this is the blessing of all those ancient dwelling places. And we see it here, and we'll see it again in chapter 22. Uh, it's described as being face-to-face, -face, intimate, personal fellowship, communion with our Creator and Redeemer. 
One of the beautiful things about God's presence in the new creation is that it's not just what uh, with the descendants of Abraham. Notice, not just the descendants of the Jews, the Israelites. We read, he will dwell with them and they will be his people. Uh, literally, they will, they will be his peoples, plural, peoples. Uh, the ultimate promises of the gospel are for every kind of people, whether black or white, whether rich or poor, whether you're from uptown, downtown, or across town. God's promise to Abram and to Abraham was that in him all the nations of the earth would be blessed. And that comes to its ultimate fulfillment in the new heavens and the new earth. He will dwell with them. They will be his peoples from all the tribes and languages, peoples and nations, whom the Lord has redeemed with his precious blood, chapter 5 told us and chapter 7 told us. So ultimately, the inheritance of the new heavens and new earth uh, is not the, the heavens and the earth. It's God. It's the Lord himself, his own presence dwelling with us, not temporarily, but eternally. Secondly, the inheritance of, the, of this uh, inhabited place new heavens, new earth, is restored life. Restored life. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. What a promise. Death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. Here, here is uh, basically the, 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 the curse being reversed. Uh, things like tears and toil, right? Things like death here, uh, crying at the death of a loved one. Think about uh, uh, Adam and Eve crying at the death of, uh, of their son Abel. Uh, uh, crying pain, the pain of, of soul, the pain of body in this life. All these former things, these fallen things passed away, verse 4 tells us. No more death, no more sorrow, no more heartache, no more tears. But notice something else here. It's not just the absence of death. Uh, the absence of sorrow, the absence of pain, the absence of tears, and so forth. It's the, it's restored life. It's fullness of life. It's life more abundantly as Jesus promised. It's life as God intended it to be. It's life as, as uh, all life is in him, and that life is the light of men, John 1 tells us. It's not just the absence of curse, it's the blessing of life in all of its fullness in the very presence of God. So the newness is inherited in terms of, uh, the inheritance is, is described here in terms of God's own presence, the restoration of life, and then thirdly, the fullness of grace, the fullness of grace. Look at verse six. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The Old Testament looks forward to a time in which God would give freely, generously, liberally from his stream of life. Psalm 36, Psalm 42, uh, Psalm 46, Psalm 63. God would give of the stream of life because he is the fountain of life. Psalm 36 again, verse number 9. Jeremiah 2, verse 13. God is the fountain of life. It all springs from him. It all comes from him. And by including this little phrase, notice, to the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. Uh, John here clues us that this image comes from the prophecy of Isaiah, chapter 55, at verse number 1. If you have your Bible, you can turn back there uh, just for a quick moment or two. Notice in Isaiah 55, uh, as the prophet is uh, speaking to beleaguered Judah, and they're on their way to go to Babylon to be exiled for their sins, yet there is hope, yet there's promise here. And so in Isaiah 55, we, we read this beautiful language of God's grace. Uh, come, everyone who thirsts. Come, everyone who thirsts. Come to the waters. And he who has no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me. Eat what is good. Delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear to me. Come to me. Hear that your soul may live. The fullness of grace. This new heavens and new earth is inhabited by the bride of Christ, by the people of God, by believers, and they are brought into the, the fullness of the grace that God has uh, poured out upon us so abundantly already, but yet we are awaiting it in its fullness. And that's described here in terms of the prophecy of Isaiah, 
and that we come to him without a payment for it. It is merely of grace, freely of grace. And so this is such great and beautiful news, isn't it? Such amazing news to us, this vision of a new heavens and a and a new earth. Uh, well, we're, we're going to just keep it tight here to the first eight verses uh, this time. We want to spend some more time next time thinking about the new Jerusalem and then again uh, of the new garden in chapter 22. But look also in chapter 21 here. There's such beautiful news here, such glorious gospel here, such comforting, encouraging words here for us. But then it ends on what seems to be a ne- very negative note, doesn't it? Verse 8. As for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. The new life that awaits us in the new creation is a new life that changes us in the here and now. If you're feeling a sense of remorse for what you've done, how you've lived your life, how you've not lived your life, This great God is calling you to repent and believe. He's calling you to turn from this and to turn to him. He's calling you to turn away from that which does not bring life. What he describes here in terms of all the kinds of sins that we so easily revel in in our fallen state. He calls you to come to the water without price, to come to him without any money in your pocket, to come to him without any righteousness of your own, to come to him without any goodness that you can bring, to come to him and to receive life to receive life. Instead of drinking of that lake that burns with fire and sulfur, drink of the water of life, he says, that refreshes us and gives us the freeness and fullness of his grace. And so if you're feeling a sense of remorse right now for how you've lived or how you've not lived, God is calling you to himself. God calls you to himself. Turn from yourself. Turn to him for mercy and grace. And when you do, you will become a new creation in this life already. The old will pass, the new will come. Your sins will be forgiven. You'll have new life in Jesus Christ. You'll have everlasting life and the down payment of that life in the Holy Spirit. And then you come to texts like this that, that, that say it's all worth it because it all in the end is going to be even more glorious than any eyes ever seen, any ears ever heard, ever enter the heart of man to ever even conceive the things that await us in glory. Notice how he tells us in verse 5 as he speaks to us of this beautiful vision of this new heavens and new earth and even of the of the of the exile of the uh, of the group of those who are outside of Jesus Christ and how they cannot receive that life but yet they receive that lake that burns with fire verse 5 the one on the throne verse that was way back in chapter 4 the one upon the throne god the father himself he says behold i'm making all things new write this down for these words are trustworthy and true such beautiful words here, such a, an amazing vision, an amazing image for us. They're trustworthy words, faithful words. Many Christians are suffering across the world. They've suffered for many generations. They've suffered for two millennia. They've suffered, we've suffered uh, from the very beginning of time uh, when Abel was persecuted and martyred for his faith by his brother Cain. The, the believing community suffers, but yet here are fa- trustworthy and faithful words. Words that we can take to the bank. Words that we can rely on. Words that we can stake our hope on and our entire existence on these faithful and trustworthy words that there will be one day a new heavens, a new earth, a place where there's righteousness, a place where there's peace, a place where there's life, a place where there's love, all things made new, newness, restoration, the presence and fellowship of Almighty God. Let's pray. We thank you, Lord. We bless you for this amazing vision. Uh, inspire our hearts, Lord, to long for that and look forward to that great day to come. And until then, may our assemblies and may our uh, services of worship, may our uh, groups, Lord, our small groups, our Bible studies, our families, our own homes, just us and you, Lord, with our with our Bible and, and praying to you, may these places be sanctuaries, tabernacles of God with man upon this uh, upon this earth. And so may people know your presence through us and may we celebrate that presence, Lord, Uh, and share your presence with all who need to know it, to come into conflict with their sins and to come into your amazing grace. Forgive us, Lord. Encourage us. And Lord, move us out in faith to go out as salt and light, to call people to repent and to believe. There's a day coming. There's a day coming when all things shall be made new, and those who are not will have no right to that life 
but we'll be outside of it forever. We ask it in Jesus' name and all of God's people say, Amen. May the Lord bless us and keep us and make his face shine upon us and be gracious to us. May the Lord lift up his countenance, his face upon you and me and give us peace both today, tomorrow, and forever. Amen.